Thank you, Mark and Richard, for inviting us. And I say us because um, we usually do this together. I do it with my wife, Faith DeLucio, who um, is a writer. I'm just a photographer. So um, we're, we've just completed another huge photography project that's taken three years that we'll show part of tomorrow. But um, right now, we're, um, Faith is home writing. I've done the pictures, so you know what have I got to do? Uh, so she's really unhappy and uh, disappointed that she can't be here, but um, that's life, right? I'm... Um, it won't be as good a presentation. No, it won't, and uh, you'll see why in a minute. <laughs> but uh, can we... Enough of me, too. I'm a photographer, and uh, it, this is about the images. Could we turn the lights down a little bit on me? I'm also so old that my, my prostate now is bigger than my ego. So I don't have to worry about this. <laughs> so this is, OK, I know what I'm doing wrong. That's what I'm doing wrong. Hey, isn't this a coincidence? Tim Brown and I ate in the same restaurant. <laughs> but uh, for the past dozen years, we've been obsessed with food. We've been eating and drinking, photographing and interviewing, learning and discovering in more than 60 countries. We always eat what locals eat and try everything we see local people eating, like deep-fried like deep starfish in Beijing and tropical fruit in Irian Jaya. That's my wife on the left. <laughs> this comes naturally for us because eating a regular diet um, is just doing whatever comes natural and we eat whatever other people are eating. But what we eat, our diet, the words, the concept, the simple list of what we eat every day has been kidnapped and tortured by nutritionists, health food addicts, the food industry, agribusiness, the government, pet food industry, you name it, and they've got a diet for you. Something simple, basic, and natural is now complex, elaborate, and increasingly unnatural. To better understand our diets, to put the planet's pantries in perspective, we came up with a really simple idea to use photographs, interviews, and statistics to show readers what the rest of the world eats. We did this in 26 countries with 35 families, photographing them with what they ate in a cup, typical week and listing the weights and total cost of all their foods. We called the book Hungry Planet. The dollar amount you see above on the right, on the left, is what the family spent on, week for the, on food for that week pictured. We saw that the planet's pantries are quickly becoming globalized and the places people stock up at are becoming huge and homogenized. Supermarkets are becoming nearly ubiquitous, and they tend to look nearly the same everywhere. It's the shoppers who look different. <laughs> we spend half of every year working all over the planet, and of course, the first thing we do when we come home is go to our local supermarket and restock our own larders. It was in these gleaming goliaths fed by agribusiness that we began to notice that something was a little bit out of whack. It wasn't the size of the soft drink or the candy aisles, the frozen food section or the snack aisles, what alerted us to the kinks in our food chain was the size of our fellow shoppers. We were growing as a nation in unhealthy ways, but most people who saw themselves getting incrementally bigger day after day, they were oblivious to the change. But coming back into the country as often as we did, we noticed changes as it was happening, and it was really frightening. If Darwin had landed at Safeway or Burning Man instead of the Galapagos, he wouldn't have seen any blue-footed boobies but he would have seen plenty of big-bottomed Bettys. He would have observed people loading up on meat, fatty snacks, sugary drinks, and highly processed foods with ingredient lists longer than chemistry projects. This phenomena has a name. It's called nutrition transition. When people have more income, they veer away from their simple diets, and they start eating more meat, more fat, and more sweet things. It's human nature to do that, because these foods in the short haul make you stronger and they taste good. Also, monitoring the consumption of these foods is much more difficult. Once you get a taste for them, it's hard to know when to stop. For thousands of years, these foods were the most difficult to obtain, so genetically, there's no built-in moderation. Here's a CDC um, graphic that um, shows the obesity trends in the United States for the last 20 years. The fact that nearly 10% of all health care is, is obesity-related makes these even scarier numbers. We're bigger than ever, but we're not exactly force-fed either. 
We do have food choices, although many of the choices are unhealthy ones. Food choices are becoming more complicated even in the far reaches of the planet. This is the Asmat, the western side of Papua New Guinea. It's a hot, swampy jungle where people live mainly as hunter-gatherers, one generation removed from headhunters. We were deep in the jungle watching a family process starch from the sago palm to make sago flour, which is the region's staple food. And each time these families cut a tree down, about once a week, they would leave part of it to rot on the jungle floor. And when they returned, they would harvest the fat, juicy Capricorn beetle grubs living in the rotten log. And of course, they'd roast them and eat them. This was one of the few sources of their protein and fat. But logging money had begun to trickle into this remote area, and with it, the first merchant selling dried food and snacks. And we watched as the kids ripped open this package of instant ramen. One ate the dry noodles, and his brother ate the flavor pack. You don't, you don't have to be a food activist to wonder if it's a good idea for people already struggling to get basic nourishment to dose themselves with jolts of sugar, salt, and artificial flavor. Carbonated soft drinks were arriving as well. This experience, for us, was an early impetus for focusing books on nutrition. Food preferences are set at a very early age, and for nearly two years, we traveled the world dining with indigenous people who still eat insects. For most people, these basic likes and dislikes stick with them for life, and they're really very strong. For example, these ladies in Venda showed us how to cook termites, and then they shared them with us for lunch. They sautéed them with onions and tomatoes, and uh, then we ate them with corn porridge called mili mili. Halfway through lunch, which was really delicious, by the way, we told them that we had just been in China eating scorpions in an equally delicious soup. And we did that with some young men who raised them in their own apartment. They were incredulous. Actually, they were outraged. Eating scorpions, we were real, nearly run out of the village. <laughs> Here in the West, we have a great aversion to these small creatures, although they're the most efficient converters of biomass to protein of any animal on the planet. Realizing this, some have suggested raising insects to feed the world to replace traditional farm animals with mini livestock. But we learned that raising insects in large numbers makes them extremely susceptible to disease and many of the same problems that come from raising regular livestock in concentrated factory farm conditions applies to raising insects in captivity. So in theory, it might make sense to grow and eat small critters, but in practice, it can be a literal nightmare. China's nutrition transition and meat consumption is something we've noted on recent trips. In fact, uh, per capita meat consumption in China surpassed Europe in 2008. They now eat more than 100 pounds per person. So when you do the math, that's over 100 billion pounds of meat every year. Because rural and city life are so different in China, we covered two families there. The rural Sui family, their food is very fresh. It's partially homegrown and largely unbranded, except for some of the beverages. And you compare that with a week's worth of food to that of the Dongs of Beijing, and you see more and more that the Beijingers are eating from the global marketplace. And in both of those pictures, you probably saw that there's a considerable amount of meat, which you wouldn't have seen a dozen years ago. The Dongs prefer to shop at the enormous Aushan hypermarket, but there are no hypermarkets in the countryside. The Sways shop at market stands. Not surprisingly, their only child, Sway Ki, has never tasted fast food. In fact, he's never eaten in a restaurant. But the city's family's son, has a favorite restaurant, and that's KFC. More than three a week are opening on the mainland. And so is this Western diet. Gains a foothold in the land of a billion people. Grain prices worldwide go up because much of the meat is grain-fed. Western diseases are also on the rise. We witness big changes in one of the world's least densely populated countries, too. Etok Village is the only big settlement within 1,000 miles on the eastern coast of Greenland. Emil Madsen, one of the last working seal hunters in Greenland, picked us up in Etok on his dog sled and took us two hours back to the village of Cap Hope, where he lived. He spent the first hour checking his cell phone messages before, before it went out of range. Cap Hope, there's only three families living there now. In order to get the full flavor of Greenland, we went hunting with Emil and his family for an entire week. We stopped at the Ice Edge, near some Manhattan-sized icebergs to look for seals for supper. He shot one seal, but it sank before he could get to it. We had better luck ice fishing 
for Arctic char in a frozen lake fed by a glacier. This resulted in one of the best meals we had while working on Hungry Planet, fresh char with curry and rice. Emil finally did get his seal. We went out on a powerboat with him just before we left, and he shot it over the kids' heads at midnight. They were sleeping in the front of the boat. 1.30 in the morning, he woke the kids up and got them to drag it back up to the house, where later that morning, Erica, his wife, did the dirty work. Traditional foods from Emil are still his favorite. His children, though, have different preferences. At home, Julian likes sugary granola and reconstituted milk. He prefers that much better than dried cod dipped in narwhal oil. <laughs> During breakfast, he played air guitar while watching satellite MTV. Most tables in Greenland do look like this now. They're highly processed food, courtesy of the shipping lanes and Greenland's status as a Danish protectorate. The bounty of the traditional hunt is still in evidence here. You can see that there's um, some, uh, some birds uh, that he shot and some, some um, musk ox and polar bear meat there. But the majority of what they now eat is highly processed, and each year that percentage is rising. As a postscript, Emil recently had a stroke at the age of 44, and he moved back into the town of Etok. Now he doesn't hunt. On average, the Japanese live 15 years longer than Greenlanders. The southernmost island in the Japanese archipelago is home to one of the highest percentages of centenarians of any place on the earth. One of them, Kama Matsuda, is 100 years old. She lives with her son and daughter. Researchers say that her diet, low in fat and high in protein, probably has contributed to her longevity. A tradition of working into their 80s and 90s is said to have helped as well. Here's a neighbor who stopped by to have lunch with us on her way to harvest her sweet potatoes. She's 97. By now, you probably heard the phrase harahachabu, which means 80 percent. This phrase was drilled into kids growing up on the Okinawan Islands. The idea is to eat until you feel 80 percent full and then stop because of the lag time and communication between your stomach and your brain. But like everywhere else, the times are changing in Okinawa. The island's heavily studied longevity rate is rapidly slipping as young people there adopt the Western diet and less active lifestyle. Foods high in fat and low in nutritional value are making big inroads. Often the healthiest diets are not in the richest countries. The Natomos in Mali eat a largely grain-based diet with seasonal fruits and vegetables, as does this Chadian family, the Mustafas. Although both are really very poor and dependent on the weather, they eat a balanced diet with little or no empty calorie food. High in the Andes, farming potatoes and raising sheep. Even the impoverished Aimé family is eating more healthily than many Americans, and they rarely eat their animals, and that's because if they sell a sheep, they can buy a lot more grain and potatoes that will last longer than the meat from the animal. Of course, without access to clean water and good health care, poor families everywhere have other issues to contend with. Unfortunately, time flies, and that's it for this mini tour of what the world eats. Tomorrow, we're going to look at what we learned from analyzing 100 individual people's daily diets after we weighed them and measured them and their food. Thank you very much.